Well, good morning and welcome to Stepping Stone Church. We're so delighted that you decided to tune in. Uh, this is a terrific season. This is the resurrection season, one of the high holy days of the Christian church. And we're excited that you tuned in and are, are here with us today. Uh, we'd also like to invite you next week to our Resurrection Sunday service. We are looking forward to a tremendous day as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there's going to be a meal afterwards. Now I got to tell you, there are some fantastic cooks here at Stepping Stone. So you don't want to miss this. And we're just, we're thanking God in advance for your presence. And as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks and please come again. Let me take you back just a few years, 50 or so, maybe a few more. But growing up as a kid, as we approached Easter, Miss Connie, we would uh, be so excited because we knew without a doubt that we would be getting a new suit and a new pair of shoes. We would make our way to uh, Foley's in downtown Houston and most times we would go into the basement because that's where the markdowns were but for us it really didn't matter Miss Cheryl we would knew we were getting a new pair of patent leather shoes and a new suit and or a new dress isn't that right Pop? I'm talking about the shoes not the dress And it was an exciting time. But they also made sure that we understood what we were celebrating. It wasn't about some little colorful bunny rabbit or boiled eggs or even a basket full of candy. We knew and we understood why we were celebrating this time. And we're going to look at a passage today. It's already been read by Ron, but if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 11 and follow with me there as we navigate through this passage. Now, we're going to do a few things this morning that helps us understand uh, this passage a little bit more in detail and we're going to take a look at it from a different angle. But I need you to help me one more time this morning. I need you to turn to your neighbor and ask them, what are you holding on to? That God wants. All right. Now, a few of y'all were a little bit slow this morning getting off on that, so we're going to try that one more time. Turn to that other neighbor, the one you missed before, and say, what are you holding on to that God wants? If I were to call some names in Scripture, you would probably know just about where these stories are or who the rest of the characters involve. Martha and Mary and maybe even Lazarus. How about Job and Elijah and the prophet Elisha? These are all familiar names and familiar stories that we know, but what happens when we come to a story like that one today? Peruse, if you will, quickly chapter 11 verses 1 through 10 just run through that and the only name that you'll see there is David all of the other characters in this passage are not named don't you find that strange anonymity Nobody's called out by their name. We see the cast of characters that are in this particular passage. The word says that Jesus sent out how many disciples? Two. Who are they? We don't know. 
anonymity. He doesn't disclose who these two disciples that he sent out. And he sent them into a village to some people who had some animals. And who are those people? We don't know. Could they have been the Browns? It doesn't say. Maybe it was the Waldens. We don't know. There's a sense of anonymity in this passage. We don't know who these people are. But there's one thing that's clear about these people. They had something that God needed. And when he made it plain to them that he needed it, they withheld it. No, they didn't. They didn't withhold it. It says, Mark uses a term throughout his gospel. If you read the gospel of Mark, you'll find this word repeated over and over again. That word is immediately. That means with the sense of urgency, without any argument, question, or debate, the passage tells us that when the disciples came to them and they found the coat there, just like he said it would be, that immediately they gave it to them. There was no question of when are you going to bring it back? How long will you have it? What, what do you plan to do with it? Because Christ had given them a simple expression to tell them when they came into contact with who these unknown people were. He said, when you come into contact with them and you find this coat, just tell them the Lord has need of it. I ask you again this morning, what is it that you have that the Lord has need of? And once you identify it, uh, how uh, reluctant are you to hand it over? Are there any trepidations that you have in uh, releasing what God has in need of? Listen, listen, I, I understand. I, I, I know what you're saying. I can see it bouncing in that space in your head. And you're saying the Lord doesn't have need of anything. I know it, I know it. You've read Psalm 24 and 1 and you've seen where it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein, for he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. The Lord doesn't have need of anything. I hear you saying that because it all belongs to him. But I'm grateful this morning that God has entrusted us as stewards of his creation. He's made each one of us unique. There's not another you, Pastor Jay. There's not another you, Ron. Thank God. <laughs> Shaheem, there's not another person just like you. And all of us have something that is unique to each of us. Maybe your hands can tickle the ebony and ivory on the keyboard. Maybe it's your voice. You can sing like that of angels, Angela. Perhaps you are, uh, you've got the qualities, John, and the characteristics of a guy named Barnabas. Maybe you're an encourager. Maybe you can walk into a kitchen and within a few hours have everybody wonder what's going on, Terry. <laughs> All of us have something that is unique to every one of us. What is it that you have? I'm not going to sit here and uh, pretend to be clairvoyant, to be a seer or a sage and look at you and be able to tell you what it is that you have. 
But whatever you have that God has gifted you with, he needs it this morning. Maybe you know how to uh, thread pipe in the pipe yards at, in this Permian Basin. God needs that this morning because over the course of threading pipe, you'll come into contact with someone and you can tell your story. You don't have to be a prolific orator. You don't have to be the next Billy Graham. All you need to be able to do is stand up and say, I know what God has done for me. What are you holding on to that God wants this morning? Maybe it's not a colt uh, uh, tied up that has never been set on. Maybe that's not what you have. Maybe you didn't come from an agrarian background and you don't know nothing about colts. But maybe it's that car you ride in. Whose car is it anyway? Maybe God just wants you to be on the lookout, Kent, like you always do and offer to give Brothers arrive to places where they don't have a vehicle to go. That's important in the kingdom. What is it that you have? I like this passage because this passage says to me that you don't have to have a big name to play an integral part in the kingdom. As we look through this passage, no one's name is there. There's not, a, there's not a Michael, there's not a John, there's not an Albert, there's not, no one is mentioned. But yet these people play an integral part in the triumphal entry of Christ. I stopped by this morning for just a few moments to tell you that you have an integral role to play in the kingdom of God. The Lord has need of what you have. And I know sometimes we say to ourselves, I don't have much to offer. But can I turn to a few pages in scripture and uh, when I get to it, 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 it tells the story of a little boy who had a happy meal. That's all he had, it was two fish and five loaves of bread and he turned it over to God and God took a happy meal and turned it into a buffet. Don't look down on what you've got. Don't, don't look at what other people have and say, well, I haven't been blessed with the voice like that. I can't play the keyboard like that. Uh, I don't know how to operate the camera or, or do this or do that. You know how to do something. There's some ability that you have that can help further the kingdom of God. Maybe it's staying a little late after Wednesday night service and the meal is served and the word is taught. Maybe it's cleaning up the kitchen. I've got news for you this morning. Kitchens don't clean themselves. I marvel when I look on these new ovens and they say self-cleaning. No, they don't. They've got guys like Arthur who said, get out of here, you've already done the cooking, let me do the cleaning. What is it that you have this morning that God wants that can help his kingdom? Here it was, these unknown people in our passage today. All they had was a donkey. But the word says, the Lord says, the Lord has need of it. And he says, and immediately he will send it. He didn't have to contemplate and say, well, if, if I send this donkey, I'm going to be one short. 
No, he didn't reason in his mind that, well, I don't know you, so I'm not sending you my donkey. In other words, he didn't come up with an excuse. I'm not intending to meddle here, so if your feet are in the aisle at this moment, I highly suggest you get them out. But there's a propensity, there's a tendency in all of us when God is calling us and says that he has need of something we have, we try to make excuses. What is it that God is calling you to and he wants from you and you've offered up an excuse? I'm not ready. They're going to laugh at me. They laughed and scorned at Christ. And if they'll do it to a green tree, what will they do to us? Can I help you this morning? Whatever it is that you have, uh, do like the hymn writer says, I surrender all. I Surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. When we come to the realization that everything we have comes from the Lord, we've, we just read it in Psalm 24, the earth this is and the fullness thereof. All means how much? Everything. All, everything. Those fancy clothes you wear, that nice car you drive, all of it belongs to God. You're just a steward. The money in your pocket, the change in your bank, you're just a steward. What is it that you have that God wants? as we embark upon this resurrection day, here is my suggestion to you. Within your leisure, within your quiet time, take inventory of what you've got. And lay it at the altar of God and, 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 and sing like the songwriter says, Lord, if you can use anything, you can use me. Take my hands and my feet. Lord, if you have anything, and whatever I have is yours. Let me just do this visual picture for you real quick. Look up here, if you will. It's hard to get something with a closed hand. But when I open my hand and I surrender it to God, guess what? He can take that, but guess what else he can do? He can fill it again. When you surrender it all to God. You know, Paul talks about this uh, he, he makes this declaration. He says, I want to live a life poured out. He says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, a libation, a drink offering. He says, I don't want to get to heaven on, on full. It would be disastrous for us to uh, close our eyes in this life and having been holding on to stuff that God wanted us to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. What is it that you have that you are withholding this morning? I find it strange that Christ didn't come in the triumphal entry on some uh, real nice Arabian steed. You know, because kings in that day and era, they rode only the finest horses. 
But yet Christ in this passage rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Here it is, the Son of God who gave up the praises of angels who resided in the hallowed halls of heaven comes and he makes his triumphal entry on a donkey. And I understood why he did it. It's taken out of scripture and a songwriter put it this way, he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He decided to give up all that he had for you, and I'm glad about it this morning, for me. He surrendered all that he had because the Father had need of it. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means before we could clean ourselves up because the reality is you can't. I can't. We're all sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. We were all very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more, but the master of the sea, he heard our despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted us. Now safe am I. It was love that lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. He gave all that he had so that you can become all that you can be. What are you holding on to that God wants? What has God been calling you to or calling you from and you've been resisting? Because you don't know, you don't understand how it's going to turn out. Well, I'm gonna pause here for just a moment and park here for about five seconds to let you know that it ain't going to turn out well if you don't surrender. The word of God tells me in Psalm that no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And I can tell you this, that when God takes something from you, he's got something better. I don't want you to get it twisted. When God allows things to leave, he's always got something better. Yes. Can I walk down your road for a minute? When he took your drinking and your drugging away, did you get something better? Yes. When he took your whoremongering and all of your other uh, infidelitous acts away, did he give you something better? God's always got something better for you. Amen. So here is my here is my suggestion to you this morning, and we're done as we uh, uh, go through this passage. There's a lot more I could tell you about, but I just want you to understand a few simple things. Number one, no one knew the names of the people involved. What does that tell me? I'm glad you asked. That tells me that. God is concerned about even those who are marginally known by society. You know, people like me and people like us. Our names are not on the marquees anywhere, but God loves us just the same. Amen. The whosoever wills, the less than the least, this anonymity suggests to me that God is concerned about even the lowest. Secondly, it, it suggests to me that if I'm willing to turn over what I have to him, 
he can make it better. This man turned over his coat and as Christ began to mount the coat, people put their coats and palm leaves on it and uh, on it and then they placed them on the ground and they rolled out the red carpet as it were for this king of kings and lord of lords he didn't show up like that but if they'd only known that the man riding on this donkey was the same man that Ruach blew breath into the life of man. If they only knew that uh, John would come along a little bit lighter and write these words. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. If they'd only known that that's who this king was. They were looking for an earthly Messiah, somebody to come back and restore Israel to prominence, but they got more than what they bargained for. He came and he did some restoration. I know you guys probably don't have one, but the ladies this morning, just uh, hypothetically let the guys borrow your mirror this morning. If you take a look in it, he came to restore you and to restore me. What do you have this morning? What are you holding on to that God wants? I won't dare answer that question for you. But that's my charge to you this week. Ask God in earnest, God, what do you want from me? I know you guys know something about surrender. I'm not going to go there this morning. But I know you guys know something about surrender and submit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for Pastor Ken for using him to deliver your word. And thank you for allowing us, allowing us to understand your word as he delivered I ask that you bless us throughout our week. And Lord, we just thank you in Jesus Christ's name. I pray, man.